Okay, everyone, we are here in week 10. Congratulations, you made it through the online class of the Sociology of Health, Illness, and Healthcare. Um, in this lecture, this will be the only one for this week. I want to um, take it easy on you all in your 10th week of the term as you're finishing up this class and other classes. Um, so what I want to do is just a sort of quick overview of the um, broader chapter about bioethics and sort of ethics in medicine from a sociological perspective. And I want to also sort of incorporate what we've talked about across the term um, to get you in a mindset that where you're ready to think broadly when it comes to the final exam. Um, so remember way, way, way long ago where we started. Um, the first lecture that you watched was about um, sort of the basics of sociology and the sociological perspective. So um, remember how I talked about um, this idea of individualism and how as Americans we um, it's, it's um, a central part of our culture and our values, really, that we embrace individualism. We emphasize individualism in the sense that we really believe that what happens to us in our lives is of our own doing, for the most part. And that is not, um, we think that about health, too. Health is not um, an exception to that. We tend to think that whatever happens to us in terms of our health and what happens to other people in terms of their health is something that they brought on, something that they can fix. Um, and so sociologists are of the opinion, typically, that this idea of individualism is really a myth. We don't get through life without help from other people, and we can't have done the things that we did, right? We can't do the things that we're going to do without some sort of opportunity structure. So, and that looks different for all people, right? So there are lots of social forces that come together to influence our lives. And that is no different in the case of health. And so if there's one thing that you've learned in this class, I hope it is an appreciation for all of the other external factors that can come together to have an impact on your health. Um, and so one of the other things that we talked about or that I talked about in the first week was sort of going off of this idea that individualism is a myth, but it's important to understand that our biography, what happens to us, occurs in a particular social and historical context, okay? And so when you apply that to health, you could ask, how is it that our health and the way that we understand health shaped by the society that we live in? What are the American values or what are the values at North Central, for example? There is a culture that we exist in and that has an influence on how we perceive the world and the culture and the structure that we live in influence our actual health, okay? But those cultural values and those structures are not the same across all societies. And so we have to think about how that particular American culture and structure or that particular North Central culture and structure are different from other kinds of social contexts. In addition to that, we have to think about the historical context. So how are the things that are happening to us in terms of our health different now than they would be if we lived in a different time, right? So you could think about, for example, this would be actually quite fitting with um, the chapter for this week. You could think about access to birth control. That's a type of reproductive technology. Um, it's not exactly new, but it's certainly still controversial. Um, the idea that people and women in particular could take a pill that would allow them to have unprotected sex and not get pregnant um, is still something that um, is very, very controversial, but more accepted now than it was in the past. And so the ease with which um, a woman could get birth control now is much different than what that looked like 
in the 50s, for example, or in the 60s even. So the historical era matters, the social context matters. And so if we place bioethics in this context, we could ask what would C. Wright Mills say about bioethics, right? C. Wright Mills is the guy who invented the term sociological imagination in the first place. And so if you go all the way back to week one, you were assigned to read a selection from um, something that he wrote um, that's very, very um, famous in sociology. And one line from this chapter that you read, um, he says the sociological imagination involves the urge to know the social and historical meaning of the individual in society. And so what he means by that is if we look back on um, history or even if we look today, the way that we um, treat people or groups says a lot about what that particular kind of person or group means in our current time and place in society, right? So if we study past and current, that should say, not past and previous, those are the same thing, past and current efforts um, to understand health, if we really examine those through a sociological lens, what do those tell us about what we think about the individual in that particular time period? Um, so, for example, if we think about the Nazi experiments or um, the children at Willowbrook or the Tuskegee um, syphilis study, all of those, um, all of those quote unquote projects, if you will, involved what one might think of as interesting medical questions, right? So um, in the experiments in the concentration camps, the doctors wanted to know what happens to the body when it freezes. Um, that is a, on its face, an interesting medical question. It's something that as doctors, as a medical community, we might want to know what is the physiological process of freezing, right? Or um, in the example of Willowbrook, doctors wanted to understand how hepatitis progresses and what happens to the body when it does. Similarly, in the Tuskegee study, doctors wanted to know what happens to a person when they have syphilis, what happens physiologically to the body. So these are all medical questions that were studied in a really horrendous way. And we only really have a full appreciation for how horrendous it was now because we can look back and see that it was that those studies were done in a way that totally disvalued particular groups of people, right? So whether those groups are Jewish concentration camp prisoners or children with mental retardation or um, poor, rural, illiterate black men. Um, so when we look back on things like that, we have a sense that, sure, these people wanted to be able to answer questions about what is happening to the body when certain things, um, when the body goes through something, but that those studies were focused on groups of people that were particularly disvalued in that historical era. And the reaction to that is to change policy so that it protects those people and this kinds of, these kinds of things don't happen to vulnerable populations again. And so I think it's interesting to also think about what C. Wright Mills, how he would see current bioethical issues. What might we say in 50 years about stem cell research, right? If we look back on stem cell research, maybe we question whether or not we as a society really view, valued um, life beginning at conception, right? So that might be one debate around, that is one debate around stem cell research because it involves embryos. And there are um, groups of people in the U.S. who believe that life begins at conception. If there's an embryo, that's a life. And if you're using that in a research context to create stem cells, that's not a proper use of life. Um, and so there's, there's a debate there. What might we think about that debate in 50 years? Or your book talks about athletes and concussions. Um, I think it's 
starting to gain a little more traction now, but maybe even five years ago, we wouldn't maybe have thought about this as a real issue. Um, if we look back on it in 50 years, we might say, wow, um, our um, ancestors 50 years ago really valued football over brain functionality. Um, and we might question the role of capitalism, for example, in health in this particular way. Um, so just sort of thinking about how the social context and the historical context play a role in um, the ethics of medicine, I think, is a really valuable exercise. So, of course, I'm going to bring it back to the ecological model. Um, this is the thread that really ties this whole course together, right? Um, and so I want to just use one of the examples that you read about, you watched a video about this debate around um, what some call the right to die. You might also hear it referred to as euthanasia. That's the medical term. Other people call it assisted suicide. Just the terminology that people use to talk about the idea that if somebody is ill, um, they may want to choose the circumstances under which they die if they know that they have a terminal illness and they will die anyway. Um, just the idea that we have different terminology for that reflects this idea that is something that's really contested in our culture um, and that we assign um, moral values to this idea of um, taking one's own life in this particular set of circumstances. So um, it seems like the obvious place to start when we think about ethics would be at the community level because that's really where you see this idea of cultural values and norms. So, you know, in particular, um, we have cultural ideas about death. We're typically afraid of it in our society. We tend to think that being alive is better than being dead. We think about the people who need us if and when we do, do die. Um, and we have thoughts about suicide, and sometimes we see suicide as a selfish act or an immoral act. Um, but on the other hand, we also have cultural ideas like freedom and individuality and liberty and those things should mean that we should be able to live our lives the way that we see fit. Um, I think these American values in particular are maybe more obvious to us when we watch something like the Vice video, which presents this issue in a totally different cultural context in the Netherlands, right? And so you can sort of compare the cases that that video talks about in the United States to the woman um, who ends up um, completing an assisted suicide in the Netherlands. Um, and you can think about how those values differ. Would you say, based on that video, that in the United States we value life more since it's more difficult to do this? Or would you say that in the Netherlands they value freedom more since it seems easier to do this there? Um, so it seems easy to start or it seems sort of um, like the obvious place to start would be at the community level. But we know from the textbook that there's an interplay between the community level and the policy level, right? So you read about um, uh, Karen Quinlan, who um, fell into a coma and her family wanted to take her off of life support um, and wanted to give what's called a do not resuscitate order, right? Often called a DNR. And her case was the first where this idea of a DNR order went um to was argued in court and so on one side it was her parents who at this point weren't even saying that they wanted to assist they wanted the doctors to assist in helping karen die um, but only that they wanted to take karen off of life support and sort of let god 
do what God was going to do. That's something that they said, right? They believed in God and that they wanted the death to be natural. They didn't want to, um, they wanted her, if she was going to live for that to be a natural process, not something that was helped by machines. Um, and so ultimate, and the doctors didn't, they didn't want to do that. Um, and so ultimately the court sided with her parents and Karen Quinlan lived for another 10 years, um, in a coma, but not on any life support. And she finally died 10 years later. So you have, now that court went, that case went to the Supreme court. And so that sets the law, um, of the land in terms of a do not resuscitate. But you also saw from the vice video that, um, at the time of that video, only four states, I think, permit assisted suicide or have, quote-unquote, right-to-die laws. Um, so you see this interplay between community and public policy. You also see um, the influence of these cultural values making their way to the individual level. So we don't get our values from a vacuum. We don't create them on our own, right? We live in a society, and those values... Um, are sort of, um, we internalize them. You could also see another um, set of arrows going from community, right, from here to the interpersonal to the individual because we're also influenced by the people who are immediately around us. So um, this idea that the values that exist within a particular community they make their way to us, we internalize them, and that's how we make decisions, right? Um, what's also interesting in the case of the right to die or the euthanasia debate um, is that at the organizational level, think about this from the doctor's perspective. So doctors take a code of ethics, or they, um, they have a code of ethics, they have rules and laws about protecting patients, and they're also afraid of lawsuits. So if they were to help somebody who had asked, please help me die in a dignified way, if you're not in one of those four states, that's going to present a real problem for the doctor. They're really trying to protect themselves from a lawsuit from somebody in the family maybe who didn't want this to happen. Um, and we also tend to see, right, you remember from a couple of weeks ago that sometimes we see this um, culture of paternalism among doctors where Sometimes they feel that they know best um, and they're making decisions on the, on the behalf of patients who cannot make those decisions maybe or even that can make those decisions. And doctors also have a culture of sort of viewing bodies as things that need to be fixed, as machines that need to be fixed. And so they may not want to give up um, on that as quickly as a person might like. So just to sort of put this one particular um, bioethical issue into this larger ecological framework that we've been sort of dealing with across the term. Um, you could use this to study any of the other um, issues that came up this week, right? So you could use this to look at stem cell research, probably starting at the community level again, right? Because the sort of center of that is a religious debate in many ways. Um, so to wrap things up, we started by talking about where we began. And so now I want you to think about what we've learned, right? So what I hope you've taken away from this class is that we can understand health by looking outward in the ecological system, right? Look towards the interpersonal, look towards the organizational, the community, the policy. How do those things affect us at the individual level? And then also thinking upstream, right? The sort of similar argument, but rather than doing, pulling one person out of the river at a time, right? Let's see what we can do to go upstream and take a more preventative approach. That usually means moving outward in the ecological model. And the other thing I hope you get out of this class is that we really should think more about the role of social institutions in shaping our health behaviors and outcomes. So um, with any given social institution, like I said, they always have some kind of behavior that they're aiming to create, right? So how is it that 
that a particular social institution wants us to behave? Who in that social institution has the power to do that? And in what ways does that social institution have a role in socially constructing our ideas of health and illness, right? You have to think about sort of like what we know about illness is man-made, is person-made, sorry, is person-made. Um, it's not necessarily a natural thing. Knowledge is created by people. And so what gets left out of that knowledge who has the power to create that knowledge? These are sociological questions that we should be asking. So you've got a final exam coming up at the end of this week. The format will be essay and the prompt will go up on Blackboard first thing Sunday morning. That's March 10th. You will have 72 hours to complete the essay exam and it will be due Tuesday, March 12th at midnight. So you'll have all day Sunday, all day Monday, all day Tuesday to complete the exam. Uh, we, the faculty, have a hard deadline in terms of turning grades in. And so I have to impose a hard deadline that no late exams will be graded unless there is some kind of verifiable emergency. So if something happens, you need to get in touch with me ASAP. Otherwise, if you turn your exam in late, it will not be graded. Um, if you have questions about that, please, please email me um, so that there are no misunderstandings. So in preparing for this exam, it's going to focus on the last six weeks. So from week five through week 10, and what I would expect you to do is to go back through your notes, your lectures, videos, podcasts, readings, and pull out the main points of each of the weeks, each of the modules. Um, make sure that you can, you know, in, in each module on Blackboard, there are um, objectives for each lesson, each module. So make sure that you have a good understanding of those objectives. Um, and I also want you to really be thinking about how the materials relate to each other. One of the things that I'll be looking for in your exams is your ability to synthesize the material that you have read, watched, listened to over the last six, over the last six weeks rather than simply um, summarizing one thing at a time, I really want you to think about how these things all relate together to you know, make a common point or a couple things relate to make a common point. So uh, I, that's one thing that I'm really paying attention to is the integration of ideas over the last six weeks. Uh, and I want to remind you that this exam will be open book but it is not open classmate. You are operating on an honor system here, and I expect everybody to work on their own. I think it's fine to talk to each other about exams, but at the end of the day, this is your work product, and you should not be working on this with anybody who is in this class. Um, if you have any questions about the final once it goes up or before it goes up, please send me an email uh, or drop into the office hours. The last office hour session will be Wednesday um, at 7 p.m. per usual. So um, otherwise, I hope you all have a great week 10. You're in the final stretch, so um, just keep plugging away and you should be seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. So I hope you all have a great week. And I'll see you on the discussion board.